I want to get your opinion on leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, through the history of time, we've seen many different leaders with different priorities. Um, I'm sure you have your own opinions on leaders. Um, and I'm really curious to hear, what do you think makes a great leader? Uh, you know, growing up, I was always taught that the president was supposed to be the greatest leader in America, um, probably in the world, to be honest, because we're such a powerful nation. Um, but everyone is flawed at the end of the day. A human being can't be perfect. So every leader is going to have their own priority. Um, what would be your idealistic version of a well-rounded leader? Oh, what a great question, Jay. That's just absolutely fantastic. I, um, it's, some, it's, it's really a question that probably we ought to, you know, it ought to be sort of like a thing, um, if I can put it that way. It ought to be sort of on the national agenda. People ought to be asking themselves that, you know, maybe on a daily basis for a while, just so that we can kind of remind ourselves of what we what we want, what we desire, what we need, what we demand, and and we can kind of evaluate um putative leaders, um, you know, kind of accordingly. We're probably not self-conscious enough, in other words, about what we really want or are looking for uh, in leaders. And insofar as we're not, we're probably more easily um, moved by kind of ad hoc, um, uh, contingent characteristics of people that just turn out to be salient, like, oh, you know, she's got a great, you know, sort of speaking voice, or she's got a really witty, smart way of talking, or he's got a kind of charisma or whatever. Um, Those things matter, but it'd probably be good if we actually asked ourselves kind of systematically and sort of self-consciously what does matter, as you've just done. So um, when I try to address that, when I think about that question, I guess I think that um, a really great leader um, would have a number of characters. One would be that the leader would be mindful of her or his jurisdiction, right? What are you a leader of, in other words? And what is the purpose of that entity uh, or arrangement or group of people that you're a leader of? So you'd want to be, you can think of that almost as being, you know, a kind of mandate consciousness, right? Be, Be fully cognizant of and attentive to what your actual mandate is, what your actual role is. So a leader of a country Um, has a somewhat different role, of course, than the leader of, let's say, uh, a church congregation or a religious colony or um, uh, um, uh, a group of people who have formed like an intentional community, um, let alone of a mayor or um, a governor or a school principal, right, or a leader of a company or something. So there's that. Um, Next, I think... um, I think a leader probably has to be curious. You want a leader to have a kind of an inquisitive mind, um, a kind of, in a sense, a kind of intellectually hungry mind, a mind that's kind of looking, who's who's sort of intrigued by things, Um, partly because it seems to me that part of the leaderly role in almost any organizational setting um, is to be sort of on the lookout for, approaches to challenges that face whatever the organization is in pursuing what it's there to pursue, right? Various obstacles that stand in its way, various challenges that confront it as it's um, moving toward its goal or trying to accomplish what it's there to accomplish. Um, You know, um, a lot of the role of a leader is essentially to kind of enable whatever the leader is leading to kind of get past certain things that that sort of stand in the way of that man of achievement of that mandate as i mentioned as i referred to it before that particular like mission so you need then a kind of mission consciousness or mandate consciousness on the one hand And then that leads you to attending to the particular obstacles that stand in the way to the achievement of that mission or or the accomplishment of that mandate. And that requires, I think, again, a kind of an intellectual curiosity, a kind of a creativity of intellect. So that would be uh, number two. Um, Number three, and by the way, when I order, you know, number one, two, three, I I don't, this is like not an order of importance. They might might all be equally important. I just really haven't given enough thought to whether there's a hierarchy here, but- but they're sort of coming to mind in this order. Um, so a, a third, uh, um, I think, attribute that's that's necessary is a kind of uh, humility or egolessness. Um, and this is somewhat difficult, I think, especially in, in, in Western tradition, in, in sort of Western ethical traditions, it's somewhat difficult um, to sort of have a leader 
who has that kind of humility, because there's a tendency for us to sort of associate, for whatever reason, leadership with ego or leadership with self-assertion. Like, you know, I'm I'm the natural leader of this group, or I deserve to be leading be following me because I'm smarter or more creative or more forceful a personality. Or we have such a tendency to sort of think in terms of self-assertion when we think in terms of leadership and hence to think in terms of a kind of self-confidence that is somehow grounded in a form of self-consciousness that involves self-elevation. But as we know, um, there's those, those are not, those are sort of, I think, accidental associations that are the product of, again, uh, a tendency, especially in, 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 in Western conceptions of leadership to sort of associate these things in a kind of Pavlovian way and then kid ourselves into thinking that even though they're just randomly and Pavlovianly associated, that they're actually somehow deeply connected, that you somehow can't have the one without the other. And, and that, that, that simply false. Um, now, it seems to me that in some other uh, uh, civilizational traditions, um, there's a much more, you know, there's, there's a much healthier sort of understanding that leadership does not have to be self-assertion uh, or ego, um, that one can in effect lead by example or lead by being inspiring or lead by the clarity of her or his moral vision, which is so clear and so powerful that people just sort of follow uh, or join, maybe is a better way of putting it, because they realize, oh, you know, she has given this so much thought that she has actually addressed questions in her own mind that I myself have had in mind, but she's addressed them so well, maybe because she's so smart, maybe because she's just given them so much time, maybe because she's just so morally earnest, that she is able actually to formulate the questions that I myself have more clearly than I myself have ever been able to do. And that has resulted in her being able to answer those questions. So she's now arrived at the point in her own sort of moral and mental life that I kind of was groping toward and wanted to get to. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and go, I'm going to join her. I'm going to go with her on this, on this particular voyage, on this particular journey or this mission. Um, and there have been, you know, great figures um, throughout human history that I think sort of fit this, this model. And while I seem to be kind of slagging the West and in saying the West tends to associate self-assertion with this, some of them have been in the West as well. Um, the ones I think who are probably, you know, some of those who come first to mind, you know, obviously somebody like Gandhi um, uh, would, would be one. Um, I think um, in your in your own um, uh, familial tradition, as I understand it, Jay, probably Ashoka would count. Um, uh, they're in the, in the kind of, Central Asian, Middle Eastern, you know, just southeast of Europe sort of tradition. Uh, the figure of Christ is, um, at least on some conceptions, understood uh, that way. Uh, and, you know, on some of the accounts, some of the Gospels, even some of the non, you know, especially in a lot of the non-canonical uh, Gospels, uh, Christ is uh, essentially of that character. He's somebody who just had a kind of a, a clarity of moral vision because he set himself apart for a while to meditate and think. And then people just followed him. He didn't have to say, I'm the leader here. I'm smarter than you. I know what's what. And of course, you know, there is a, there is a tradition uh, that uh, the, the so-called lost years of Jesus were spent in Srinagar, right? That he actually was in a uh, either a Jain or a Buddhist uh, monastery in his uh, late youth and early adulthood before then going back to his homeland. Um, <clears throat> but I've always thought that significant, right? That even the probably the, 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 the most celebrated moral figure in the so-called West might actually himself have an, an Eastern, uh, at least a, part, a partly Eastern uh, formation. Um, other figures, um, you know, obviously uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King uh, here in the West is probably one of the, if not the most uh, renowned and revered moral leader um, in sort of this hemisphere, who, of course, himself was uh, very much inspired both by, by Christ and by, by Gandhi. Um, but then even somewhat more prosaically and less exaltedly, um, George Washington uh, is very uh, highly regarded still uh, by historians um, because, you know, even the ones, even so-called revisionist historians who are always like on the lookout 
for evidence uh, or justification to debunk um, historically lionized figures uh, end up, you know, coming away from looking into all of the, you know, the deep historical record on, on, on Washington and sort of saying, God, you know, this guy, he actually kind of was what he purported to be. I mean, he actually was on the level. He was, now obviously he was profoundly flawed having, um, you know, participated in a slave owning culture and having owned slaves and the like. So I don't want to, I don't want to portray him as some sort of a saint, but uh, by any, you know, by any stretch and, and, you know, Gandhi and King and uh, would have been the first to admit that they were saints either in, in the kind of like moral perfection sense. But, but one thing that all of these folk seem to have had in common is they weren't self-assertive in the sense of like, you know, like a Donald Trump where they're saying, you know, just claiming the role, just saying, follow me because I know more or I have a very good brain, you know, or I, uh, I'm, I'm smarter than you are or I'm, I've got a forceful personality. Or I, I'm just, I'm blessed with a kind of a magic. Everything I touch turns to gold. I'm King Midas. I'm, I'm um, you know, everything I, I, I I'm sort of... Um, I have the magic touch or whatever. They were all, none of them did that, right? What they did was they simply fixated their vision on what the goal was and what the right way of being was. And then they exuded a kind of magic that comes with that. So as I understand it from all of the, the reading that I've done of, uh, in the sort of American revolutionary era, they followed Washington, not because he said, follow me or look at me. In fact, he didn't even want to lead. You know, he tried to, he tried to say, now, nah, you know, I just want to be on my farm. But they just thought, holy crap, you know, everybody wants to be this guy. This guy is really cool. Um, and so he just was what, you know, somebody like Trump is sort of trying to be or claiming to be or talking about being. Um, and I think it was largely the same, obviously, with, with Gandhi, right? Gandhi preached plenty, but Gandhi just was Gandhi. He lived Gandhi. Uh, and King lived King. And I think of that as a kind of humility. Um, you know, it's, it, it requires a certain sort of um, chutzpah, I guess you could say, to be ready to lead a huge movement. But the key, the thing that makes it uh, sort of real leadership and humility rather than sort of self-assertion is that it's not like self-conscious leadership in the sense that you're you're saying you, that you view yourself as having a right to lead because you are in some sense better. Um, instead, you take yourself out of it in a certain sense and you just keep your eyes sort of fixed on the ball. You know, there, there was this sort of, um, this is going to sound like a really silly example in a way, but I remember in a film uh, once there was a scene where some guy is trying to master um, the way of the samurai cudgel, you know, sort of stick fighting or whatever. Uh, I think it was that, or maybe it was with swords or something, but <clears throat> in any event, and he just kept losing uh, in these like little sort of sparring matches. Uh, and finally, somebody, you know, intervenes for a second and says, too many mind, you know, you're, you're sort of thinking about yourself doing this. And that's in, it's in the way that's preventing you from, from actually doing what needs to be done, um, that it's actually the self consciousness, that's the problem here. Um, so he said, you know, you have, you know, mind on self, mind on stance, mind on stick, mind on, and then too many mind, uh, and then says something like no mind, um, you know, speaking very simply. Um, and then the guy suddenly does really well, um, <laughs> which is, again, which is what makes the whole moment sort of like a cartoon sort of silly, but, but there's something really profound in that, right? Even in sort of goofy pop culture, you can sometimes find really profound messages. It seems to be. And there, the key is you just take your bloody self out of it. You know, just don't, don't be looking at yourself doing this. Um, just be looking at this. <laughs> and if you just look at this, then you can do this. Whereas if you're looking at doing this when you're doing it, then you're not really going to do it. And I think that leadership is maybe a bit like that, right? That if you're thinking of how literally am I being now? Do I look like a leader? What am I projecting here? You know, then you're really going to flub it up. Um, and you're really going to, you know, you're going to take a pratfall. But if you're just, so I think that's sort of something along those lines is what I have in mind by, by humility when I, when I say that. And it seems to me, Jay, that if you have those three things, you're probably fairly well equipped to be a pretty effective leader, if not a great leader. 
um, whatever the movement, whatever the mission, whatever the entity or or grouping um, that that you're leading, this is sometimes, of course, described as or referred to as you know leading from behind. Um, and I think that there's just an awful lot of wisdom in that. You know, at least sort of what I would want to do if I were a leader. Yeah, there's definitely a lot in there that you said that resonates with me and what I believe leadership is. I <clears throat> really do believe actions speak louder than words. Yeah. We have career politicians right now that it seems like the only skill they know is how to get reelected. Yeah. And I don't really know if that's a skill that you want to have a leader in. Mm -hmm. uh, you maybe want to have a leader who's great at building out products or very great at empathizing with human beings, but people can be charismatic and trick other people all the time. Words mean yeah. nothing. Actions, watch their actions, not their words. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Elon Musk fanboy because of what he's done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is he perfect? No. Does he make a lot of stupid mistakes? Sure. Yeah. Any person would be, if you put him on a pedestal and you listen to every single thought that comes out of someone's mouth and they can send it out to hundreds of millions of people in a second. Uh, but Elon Musk said, and this was just his thought on leadership. And you actually said this too was I didn't want to have to do what I had to do, but no one else was doing it. So I felt obliged to do it. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that thought that like great leaders don't like are the guys that are the loud guys in high school that are trying to be the alpha male or, you know, just trying to put on a show to mm -hmm. act like a leader mm -hmm. because there might be some benefit social, whatever it have be. Um, that are really the best leaders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's so many points there that you laid out that I'm not going to reiterate because you did a great job of, of pointing them out. And I agree with so many of them. I really wanted to emphasize that point of empathy though, mm -hmm. and really being empathetic. You can be strong, mm -hmm. but at mm -hmm. the same time, empathetic and mm -hmm. understand people that you're supposed to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would even add that. I mean, I, I probably should have been a little clearer when I when I talked about the sort of the curiosity uh, element uh, as as one of the first. Um, I really should have emphasized that more. I, I, I can't thank you enough for for bringing that into this too. Part of the curiosity, I think, has to be a curiosity about how it's looking to somebody else, how it's all looking, or what's being faced by. Um, and that is so important that it really, I think you're right, it deserves being drawn out separately as its own uh, characteristic, right? Sort of empathize, be able to be the other person or the other persons in a certain sense um, and, and, and love them, right? I mean, this might even warrant separate, um, you know, sort of separate notice as well, even though you could, I suppose, fold it under curiosity or fold it under empathy, which you then fold under curiosity. But but this is going to sound kind of corny and hippy dippy, but I really think love is is critical here too. You really have to love um, those on whose behalves or with whom you are working, um, with whom you are collaborating, with whom you are in this together, right? Because we are, you know, basically any if we to talk leader is automatically to talk more than one person. Um, that means you're automatically talking about a we rather than just an I, and even rather than just a bunch of separate eyes, because the eyes are brought together by the mission that defines the, the, the grouping or the organization. And insofar as they're brought together by that, they actually become something more than separate eyes. They become a we. And you really have to love, I think, the, this we to be part of it. And you have to love every I that goes into constituting uh, this we. And part of that love, you know, sort of, it almost kind of in a certain sense is that love, is that empathy, right? That sort of being the other people in addition to being yourself in a certain sense. And that's, you know, I think you're so right. It, it, uh, I, should have, I should have actually thought to mention that just, you know, separately. So you know, thank you, Jay, for that. That's exactly right, I think. I think one of the biggest things that faces a leader is limited resources and how to allocate that efficiently. Mm -hmm. And that speaks volumes because, you know, everyone wants to be helped in mm -hmm. some regard, but you only have so many limited resources. How do you allocate that efficiently mm -hmm. without having, uh, oh, well, this guy's 
playing favorites to this side or that side. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because it seems the way it's structured in government is you need to get reelected. So you kind of have to play favorites to some degree. And that really hinders your ability to make uh, overwhelming change. Um, and yeah. I don't know a solution to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> kind of like like you, Jay. I, I sort of um, I think about that with some frequency, or I kind of contemplate it, and um, with a view, with a hope to sort of gleaning some kind of general lesson that might be um, sort of that then might serve as a kind of a protocol or as a kind of a strategy or as a way of being um, in order to sort of ensure that, that, that leadership is, is better leadership. And I, I don't know for sure whether I, I haven't decided yet, or I'm just not sure yet whether I can generalize from the example I'm, I'm about to mention, but it might be that we can. So I'm going to offer it as at least a sort of a, a working hypothesis, even if it turns out not to be quite right. <laughs>